Hello, I'm Matthew Jaron, museum curator at the University of Dundee, and welcome to the latest in a series of short films in which I talk about some of the highlights from the university museum collections. And today we're going to be looking at a really interesting textile design collection from a pioneering project known as the Needlework Development Scheme. Now the scheme began thanks to the Paisley-based thread manufacturer J&P Coates. Uh, at that time, Coates was one of the world's largest companies. They had branches across the globe. And they were obviously really keen to promote needlework, embroidery, any kind of stitch textiles, because of course that increased their sales of thread. And because of this international perspective, they were able to see that on the continent, uh, embroidery was very much taken seriously as a, as a serious art form, and a lot of really interesting uh, modern designs were being created. But here in Scotland, uh, there wasn't really anything particularly exciting happening. And so they were very keen to try and encourage more use of creative embroidery and needlework uh, here in Scotland. Now, the art colleges were very keen to be part of uh, any project that involved revitalising interest in embroidery, uh, but they were a bit wary about associating themselves directly with a private company like Coates. And uh, in particular, Francis Cooper, who was principal of Dundee College of Art, now Duncan of Jordanson, was absolutely adamant that it was not appropriate for a publicly funded body like an art college to be in any way seen to be promoting a specific product like Coates's thread. So Coates remained an anonymous benefactor of the scheme, which was ostensibly run by a committee uh, which comprised the heads of each of the four art colleges. And in practice, the scheme was run by an employee of Coates called Colin Martin. And Coates sent their representatives around Europe to collect examples of traditional embroidery. So we'll see some of the examples here that we've got in the collection. So um, this one, for example, is from Hungary. Here's one from Albania, Estonia, Bulgaria, Greece, Norway, and also uh, traditional Scottish embroidery as well. So here's a, an Ayrshire christening robe, for example, or uh, Paisley shawls. And while Coates' representatives were travelling to collect these traditional examples of embroidery, uh, the art colleges also chose representatives to try and acquire more modern, state-of-the-art, uh, cutting-edge designs. And in Dundee, that task fell to Alec Russell, who was head of design. And Russell chose to focus on Germany and Austria, and made a number of trips uh, there in 1934-35, uh, collecting examples of uh, really interesting modernist designs. So, for example, here is a lovely cushion from Germany by a designer called Hedda Kuhlenberg. Uh, we also have this really nice uh, panel of a thorn by Sousa Sardeman Bernuth. And in particular, he was very keen on an Austrian designer called Emmy Zweibruck. Uh, and we have several pieces by her in the collection, including this nice tea cosy. Now, of course, Russell was travelling to these countries uh, in the early 30s at the very time when everything was changing politically. Germany, of course, had already become uh, the Nazi state. Austria would, of course, become part of the Third Reich uh, fairly soon after. And, of course, a lot of these designers that he's dealing with um, ended up having to do work for the Nazi regime. So, for example, Emmy Zweibruck uh, created this piece called Sun Blessing in 1934. I'm sorry, it's not a particularly good image. Um, so it's a scene of Venice, so of course it's automatically linking Austria to another fascist country, Italy. Uh, but more notably, the text that's written around the outside, um, which is part of a poem, May the sun bless over the holy distance, may the sails glide over the free open spaces. And that was actually written by um, a man called Edwin Redslob, who was actually Hitler's state art officer in Nazi Germany. So this is Weibruck very clearly trying to align uh, this piece to Nazi ideology. But of course the scheme was also collecting modern pieces from many other European countries. So for example, here is a, a Danish piece of showing Thor uh, by the um, Copenhagen-based designer Holger Kappel from 1938. Uh, here's a lovely Swedish uh, tea cosy design. Unfortunately, we don't know the, the name of the designer for this one. 
Uh, here's a Hungarian design. Uh, again, we don't know the specific designer, but this was uh, created by a member of the Society for Applied Arts in Budapest. So quite often courts would be dealing specifically with uh, either art schools or art societies in different countries that were noted for um, their forward-thinking designs. Uh, and they were also acquiring uh, new British designs as well. So this is one of my favourites, for example, a uh, wonderfully sort of Art Deco style hair uh, designed by Charles Payne and created by Molly Ratton at the Royal School of Needlework in London. Uh, this is 1935. Uh, one of the most notable modernist designers of the time was the London-based Rebecca Crompton, and we have several examples of her work. So here's a 1934 piece called The Creation of Flowers, and another one from 1937 called Spirit of the Future. And where possible, they were acquiring new Scottish designs as well. So here's a piece called New Haven Fisheries uh, by a Kirkcaldy-based Lena Duthie, 1934. And the scheme was also collecting from the four Scottish art colleges. Uh, here in Dundee, the teacher of embroidery at that time was Angela Bradshaw, who had actually just come at the time the scheme started in 1934. Uh, so here's an example of one of her designs, for example. Now, several examples of work of Dundee students were collected by the scheme, but unfortunately none of them actually ended up coming to our collection, sadly. But we do have photographs of them, as you can see here. Now, with the outbreak of war in 1939, of course, the scheme had to come to an end. The kind of international travel that, that it required simply wasn't possible anymore. And at that time, uh, each art college was gifted 30 pieces from the collection that the scheme had built up. Uh, so, for example, we got several of these German and Austrian pieces that Russell had collected. And then after the war, Coates were really keen to re-establish the scheme, but this time they were actually more ambitious and they wanted to extend it across the whole of the UK. So not only were they continuing to work with the four Scottish art colleges, but they were also working with the V&A in London, with the Royal Scottish Museum, and with various other bodies to really try and make it a UK-wide uh, scheme. And they began to promote the scheme much more widely in education, so not only in the art colleges, but also to schools, to local embroiderers, guilds, and as well as having the actual pieces that they lent out, uh, they produced all sorts of different educational tools. So, for example, uh, slideshows like this here. Um, they produced little folders of, of different sort of design ideas and so on. Um, and publications. So there was a whole series of different uh, newsletters, magazines, booklets and so on that, that came out uh, like these ones. And to help with acquiring some of the latest modern post-war designs, uh, Coates began to employ uh, leading European designers to uh, positions in the scheme. And the first of these was the German designer Elsie Kohler. Now, Kohler had worked in Vienna during the Nazi era, and we have this wonderful piece that she created uh, there in the collection. Uh, she was then replaced by the Swedish designer, Ulla Kokum, and uh, we have this fantastic uh, Christmas mat from 1949 that was designed by Kokum, and she also very much encouraged uh, collecting other contemporary Swedish textiles. So again, we have some really nice examples. Uh, so this cushion cover, for example, is by Ingegerd Stilow. 1947, and this runner by Britt Forsberg, 1948. And again, the scheme was keen to collect both old and new embroidery styles. And so we have wonderful pieces from all over the world. They really extended the range of their collecting this time. So for example, this is from Armenia, uh, from Uzbekistan, Transylvania, from Spain, from Turkey, from China, from India, from Paraguay, uh, some native designs from North America. Um, often the provenance is frustratingly inadequate. So for example, this piece is just from Africa. <laughs> We've no idea where. Uh, similarly, this is from Arabia. And again, they were collecting some, some modern British designs as well. So, for example, we've got a nice series of mats from a Welsh designer called Nash. Uh, this is a tablecloth for a sun lounge. Um, don't know the designer, unfortunately. And again, some nice Scottish pieces. So, uh, this is a workbox by Betty Fraser, who was at the time was a student at Glasgow School of Art. Went on to be better known as Betty Fraser Myerscough, a very famous Scottish designer. 
And perhaps most notably, this piece by another Glasgow School of Art student, Marion Gracie, from 1952. And just a few years after this, uh, Gracie would end up coming to Dundee to teach embroidery uh, as Marion Stewart. So the scheme eventually came to an end in 1961, and the remaining collection was divided up and went to various different organisations, including the Embroiderers Guild and various museums and schools all around the UK. But the four Scottish art colleges were given uh, a further 70 pieces each. And in Dundee, Marion Stewart was the one who ended up making that selection. And then she then helped to organise an exhibition that was held in the art college of all the pieces that the college had acquired. So we now have about 125 pieces from uh, the Needlework Development Scheme in our collection. And it gets very widely used. We've done a number of exhibitions from the collection. It comes regularly out to be shown to students. Uh, and we get visits from the Embroiderers Guild and other special interest group. Uh, so it's definitely one of the collections that uh, attracts a huge amount of interest. So overall, the Needlework Development Scheme was a hugely important project. Not only did it improve technique through uh, the various educational resources, but it really played, I think, a very significant part in developing modern textile design in Scotland and indeed around the UK. And so we're really delighted to have this small part of this really important uh, distributed national collection. So that's it for me. Hope you found that interesting uh, and tune in again to hear another story about our fantastic collections coming soon. Bye for now.